When we consider this short prophecy, we are left in no doubt, are we? When we look at the first verse as to what it's all about. It is the burden of Nineveh. Once a great city, the capital of a mighty empire, which is no longer. It's the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite. Now we know that very often, especially with the prophets, the meaning of the names of the words very often portray what the prophet has to say. Nahum means comfort. Not for Nineveh. Nahum chapter 3, Nineveh is laid waste, who will bemoan her? When shall I seek comforters for thee? So, running through this prophecy, there is comfort for Judah, as we shall see, in amongst the impending judgments on the city of Nineveh. <clears throat> what does Elkishite mean? This is interesting because we look at Strong's Concordance, Young's Concordance, Jusenius, they don't give us any meaning. All that they do is try to say what, where this place might have been. Online Bible tells us that Elkishite means L and snares. Uh, and if that's correct, we can put the two ideas together, can't we? It is a vision of comfort for Judah because Ael ensnares Assyria. Well, that's one meaning that I found. Uh, looking at this dictionary of scripture names, it says that Elkishite means the gathered of God. And when we think about that, it puts an entirely different complexion uh, on the whole of the message. A vision of comfort for those whom El will gather. And we think of verses like that one in the Psalm, Psalm 50. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heaven shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. And that's speaking about the kingdom, isn't it? And there are echoes of the kingdom in the prophecy of Nahum. We've just read the last verse of chapter 1, haven't we? Uh, let's remind ourselves. Behold upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings and publisheth peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feasts, perform thy vows. And we'll come back to that verse later on. So what we find in this prophecy are two beautifully interwoven themes. The main theme is the destruction of Assyria. But intertwined through that we've got comfort for Judah. We've seen it already in chapter 1 and verse 15. And there are also glimpses of future glory. And we'll come to that uh, late as we go through as well. We ask the question, when did Nahum prophesy? We, we're not told. All that we can say is, it must have been after the Assyrians had sacked Thebes. Because that is mentioned in the prophecy. If we just go to chapter 3 of Nahum, and at verse 8... We read there, Art thou better than populous? No. That is speaking about Thebes. Some of the modern versions actually put Thebes in there. So Nahum speaks about the destruction of Thebes. So his prophecy must have been after that event. But it obviously it was before the fall of Nineveh. So we've got those two dates, 663 and 610 BC. It, it's somewhere between those two dates. 
and that's as, uh, as sure as we, can, as we can be about it. Now I'm sure we all know, don't we, that there are two prophets that prophesy to Assyria. There's Jonah and Nahum. Jonah came first and Jonah demonstrates the goodness of God because we know that Jonah prophesied to Assyria, to Nineveh, and they repented and the judgment was spared. It has been said that really Jonah would have liked to have said what Nahum did say. Nahum came 120 years later and he prophesied the destruction. Uh, just a quick look at chapter 2 of Nahum and at verse 13 where we read Behold I am against thee, saith Yahweh of hosts and I will burn her chariots in the smoke and the sword shall devour thy young lions and I will cut off thy prey from the earth completely removed from the earth and the voice of thy messengers shall no more be heard so it's a message of destruction indeed for that city we can actually draw a timeline looking as we've said here at the the goodness and the severity of God with not just Israel and Judah but with Assyria as well. God doesn't change, does he? If we just quickly skim through this, we've already mentioned the fact that when Jonah prophesied to Nineveh, they repented and the city was spared because of Jonah's prophecies, the goodness of God. Moving on a few years, Samaria forced to Assyria after countless visits from the prophets. Eventually, the long suffering of God came to an end as far as the northern kingdom was concerned, and they were taken into captivity. Coming back to uh, Nineveh, we are all very familiar with what happened in the days of Sennacherib, how that Sennacherib's army was completely destroyed. Now, in one respect, that was a warning to Nineveh to take the God of Israel seriously. And sadly, they didn't. And so, really, Nahum's prophecy we could describe as the second warning, the second and final warning to Assyria. And then, of course, eventually, Nineveh was destroyed by the Medes and the Babylonians. And just to finish this off, we know that eventually Jerusalem also falls. And then we've got the goodness and the severity of God with the different nations. Now, one other thing I'd like to look at before we uh, dip into the prophecy in a bit of detail is the growing expansion of the Assyrian Empire. Now, in, in 1350 BC, that's what, in the time of the judges, actually, as far as Israel is concerned, that was the size of Nineveh. It was way over there somewhere, and it was no threat at all to Israel. 1300 BC, they'd expanded as far as the river Euphrates, and the expansion continues. 1225, big jump to 875 BC. And while they were expanding over there in the east, it wasn't too much of a threat to Israel once again. But when we come to 850, see where they're expanding now. And now we're in the time of Jehoshaphat, just to try and tie this in with, with the nation of Israel. And then, of course, 19 years before the fall of Samaria, this is what the Assyrian Empire looked like. It was growing and it was growing and it was growing. And, and we read, don't we, that eventually Samaria falls. And, and that's 700 BC 
as it shows on the map. And we know that Samaria was taken in 716. And at the same time, we read in the Kings, now in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, that's approximately 700 BC, did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the fences of Judah and took them? And we've got that prophecy in Isaiah. He reached even to the neck. It was just Jerusalem and faithful Hezekiah that was holding out against the Assyrians at that time. And of course after that, they, they went down into Egypt. And that, that was when they, they destroyed Thebes. So just think, looking at that map, it's amazing, isn't it? How it, it grew and it grew and it grew. The mighty Assyrian Empire. Psalm 77 was most likely written around about this time by Hezekiah. Will the Lord cast off forever? Will he be favourable no more? Is his mercy clean gone forever? Doth his promise fail forevermore? Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Hath he in anger shut up his tender mercies? And it was possibly because he was looking at what was happening here. This Assyrian Empire was unstoppable. And in human terms, it was just a matter of time before Jerusalem fell as well. But of course, it's later on in that psalm, isn't it, that, that Hezekiah says, I will meditate also of thy work and talk of thy doings. Thou art the God that doest wonders. Thou hast declared thy strength among the people. And I, I suspect that was written actually before the destruction of Sennacherib. It shows the faith that Hezekiah had at that time. Well, let's move in now to consider the prophecy itself. We've read chapter 1, haven't we? Chapter 1, verses 2 to 8. We won't read right through them again. But basically it's saying, Assyria to be destroyed, comfort to Judah. And we can see a chiasm here. Verse 2, vengeance. Yahweh's vengeance. God is jealous and Yahweh revengeth. Yahweh revengeth and is furious. He will take vengeance. And if we just drop down to verse 8, we've got the same message in verse 8 of chapter 1. With an overrunning flood he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. Utter destruction. And yet, if we look at the beginning of verse 3, what does it say there? Yahweh is slow to anger. And surely that, that's a message for Judah at this time. That's not a message for, for Nineveh. Because Nineveh's fate was sealed by this stage. And again, in verse 7, Yahweh is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that put their trust in him. So we see the chiasm building up, don't we? And in the middle of it, what is it? It is a declaration of the absolute power of our God. Let's just look at verses 5 and 6, for example. The mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. So that's the first few verses of Nahum. That's the introduction that we get. We did know Isaiah that Assyria was the rod of Yahweh's anger against the nation of Israel. 
I will send him against an hypocritical nation, against the people of my wrath. Will I give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets? And that's exactly what they did. The archaeologists have, have discovered a lot around, particularly Lakish, but Nineveh as well. Uh, and there's a relief that shows the Hebrews being taken off into captivity. Assyria was a wicked, horrible, bloodthirsty nation. We called it there a brutal and bloodthirsty nation, was the Assyrians. It's as though they were, they were proud of it. They would see the Assyrians flaying Hebrews alive at the siege of Lachish. There's a Hebrew about to be beheaded by an Assyrian. There's the Hebrews being hung on the wall of Lachish. And these things, we, we can see them all in the British Museum and we can read about them in, in books on archaeology. So that was the nation that Yahweh chose to bring judgment on the nation of Israel after, as we've mentioned, countless warnings that judgment would come. So back in chapter 1 of Nahum, what do ye imagine against Yahweh? You see, that's what the Assyrians did. What they said and what they thought they would do was nothing but imagination. That was the final warning. He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. They will be gone, completely destroyed forever. And we know that that same warning was given earlier on in the days of Sennacherib. We won't turn to Isaiah 36 at the moment. It's when we come to verse 11, we read, There is one come out of thee that imagineth evil against Yahweh, a wicked counsellor. We're not told who that is in the days of Nahum. We know at the first warning, we are told who it was. Perhaps we will go to Isaiah 36, shall we? And have a quick look there at what the wicked counsellor said on that occasion. So Isaiah 36. And if we go in at verse... 13. I'm sure we know these words well. Then Rabshakeh, here's the wicked counsellor, in those, in those days, stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and said, Hear ye the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you. Look at verse 18. Beware lest Hezekiah persuade you, saying, Yahweh will deliver us. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who are they among all the gods of these lands that have delivered their land out of my hand, that Yahweh should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? I will destroy Jerusalem, is what Rab Shekhar was saying there. But we know what happens, don't we? It was pure imagination as far as Rab Shekhar was concerned. We think of that psalm there, Psalm 21. They intended evil against thee. They imagined a mischievous device which they were not able to perform. Mm -hmm. 
Now let's just bring this up to date because things don't change, do they? We call this the imagination of man versus the purpose of God. This is what the humanists say. Humanist action does not draw its inspiration from imaginative theories about God, nature, society or history. They've got the whole thing upside down, haven't they? They, they think that theories about God are imagination. They say, we begin with life's necessities, which consist most elementally of avoiding pain and moving towards pleasure. And that's the way that the world is today, isn't it? And when it says avoiding pain, it's not talking particularly about physical pain. If you don't like it, ignore it. And just hope it'll go away. And that's the way that many people think nowadays. And it can creep into uh, the brotherhood as well sometimes. If you don't like it, just avoid it. And it's all about pleasure, having fun, enjoying yourself. And of course, they can do this for a short period of time, can't they? But eventually, we know that the judgment will come. Yahweh saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And we wonder, don't we, whether we have reached that stage now because the Master said, when he returns, it will be as the days of Noah, when they imagined mischief against Yahweh and things that they were not able to perform. So back to the prophet Nahum, chapter 1. And at verse 12. A tricky verse here. Thus saith Yahweh, though they be quiet, and likewise many, yet thus shall they be cut down, when he shall pass through. Though I have afflicted thee, I will afflict thee no more. Now we've got we've got four parties. In that verse, we've got they, we've got he, we've got I, and we've got thee. And I suppose we need to really identify them if possible, don't we? Who are they to begin with? I think it's this Syrian army. Though they be quiet, the word means safe. They felt safe because they were many. Yet thus shall they be cut down when he shall pass through. So who is he? I suppose we could say it, it's related to the invading armies and so it was. I believe it's referring to the angel who passes through. As the angel passed through the land of Egypt, I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn of the land of Egypt. I, obviously, is Yahweh. Isaiah there says, For through the voice of Yahweh shall the Assyrians be beaten down. Not the invading armies, but through the voice of Yahweh. Isaiah chapter 13 verse 31. So we're saying the I in these verses is referring to none other than Yahweh himself. The, who is the? Um, though I have afflicted thee no more, sorry, though I have afflicted thee, I will afflict thee no more. And surely that's a message to Judah at this time. And we see how the, the two are interwoven throughout the prophecy. Syria and Judah. Just look at the next verse, verse 13. For now will I break his yoke from off thee, 
and will burst thy bonds in sunder. His yoke, the Assyrian yoke, will be broken. And the thee here is obviously Judah once again. Come to chapter 1 and verse 14. Yahweh has given a commandment concerning thee. But now it's a different thee. It's not Judah this time. It, it's Assyria that this verse is speaking about. The end of the verse says, I will make thy grave for thou art vile. And then verse 15 takes us into the future. Chapter 2 and verse 1. He that dasheth in pieces is come up before thy face. A reference to the invading armies. And verse 2 of chapter 2. We're back to Israel again. And then it's in verse 3 it's the enemies. So we see how it, it jumps around the prophecy does. And it's a case of understanding exactly who the prophet is speaking about on these different occasions. So, into chapter 2. He that dasheth in pieces is come up before thy face. We read from Wikipedia here. The Battle of Nineveh is conventionally dated between 613 and 611, with 612 being the most supported date. An Allied army composed of the Medes, the Chaldeans, rebelling against the Assyrians, together with Scythians and Cimmerians, besieged and sacked Nineveh. There's four nations mentioned there. And we say, why does it say he that dasheth in pieces? I suggest it's a reference to the angel once again. Who knows, it might even have been the Archangel Michael, the one who was always there to protect Israel. It was the same angel that destroyed Sennacherib's army. So, that's in chapter 2 and verse 1. Verse 2 of chapter 2. For Yahweh hath turned away the excellency of Jacob as the excellency of Israel. For the emptiers have emptied them out and marred their vine branches. Obviously speaking about Israel and Judah, the excellency of Jacob is a theme that runs through scripture. Read in Amos, I abhor the excellency of Jacob, I hate his palaces. But then again we read in the Psalms, He shall choose our inheritance for us, the excellency of Jacob whom he loved. And it looks on the surface as though there's a contradiction there. I hate them, I love them. But it's a matter of timing, isn't it? You see, Amos is speaking about the same time period as Ezekiel there. Thus saith the Lord Yahweh, Behold, I will profane my sanctuary, the excellency of your strength, the desire of your eyes, that your soul pitieth, and your sons and your daughters, whom ye have left, shall fall by the sword. They were concerned with themselves and they'd forgotten their God. And that was when the Lord abhorred the excellency of Jacob. And yet we know, don't we, that the time is coming, Isaiah 60. Whereas thou hast been forsaken and hated, so that no man went through thee, I will make thee an eternal excellency, a joy of many generations. If we look at the revised version of verse 2 of chapter 2, it reads like that. Yahweh bringeth again 
the excellency of Jacob as the excellency of Israel. For the empty as I've emptied them out and marred their vine branches, but the time is coming, Nahum says, when the excellency of Jacob will be restored once again. So what about verses 3 and 4? Describing the invading armies as they invade Nineveh. Verse 3, the shield of his mighty men is made red and the valiant are clothed with scarlet and so on and so on. I'll just put on the screen what the RV, how that uh, translates those two verses. The shield of his mighty men is made red. The word means to be rubbed or dyed red. And that's what the Babylonians did very often. They, they, it was like they painted their swords red to make it look as though it was the blood of the enemy. It was a way of instilling fear into the enemy. They were clothed with scarlet. The chariots flash with steel in the day of his preparation for war. The spears are shaken terribly. As rather it puts that, the lances are put in motion. Verse 4, the chariots rage in the streets. They jostle one against another in the broad ways. And that's interesting, the broad ways. Because if we go to the British Museum again, and we look at the Bellino cylinder, where Sennacherib boasts, we put it on the screen there, I, Sennacherib, widened its squares and made bright the avenues and streets and cause them to shine like the day. And now in those broad ways, the chariots of the enemy are raging through the city. Verse 5. Let's just read verse 5. He shall recount his worthies. They shall stumble in their walk. They shall make haste to the wall thereof and the defence shall be prepared. This is Rotherham. Let him, who's the him? Presumably the, the, the last king of Assyria. I won't try and pronounce his name, there it is. But it says, they shall stumble as they go. It's a strange thing, isn't it? As they were going toward the wall, they would stumble. The historian tells us that when the soldiers were called to defend the city, they were drunken. That's why they stumble. We read it in verse 10 of chapter 1. While they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble, fully dry. So let's just look at this on the, on, on the diagram of, of Syria, shall we? Of Nineveh, rather. That's the best that we can do for the, the armies. I think there are a few more than, what, six or eight men, but there they are. They come to the wall. That's what the verse is telling us. RV says, he remembereth his worthies, they stumble in their march, they make haste to the wall thereof, and the mantelet is prepared. When I read that, I thought, what's a mantelet? So we go to the dictionary to find out what a mantelet is. It's a movable shelter used by the invading armies. And that's what the last phrase of the verse is speaking about. We see it with Rotherham. Yet the storming cover is prepared. So we've got the enemy. We've got the two armies separated only by a wall and the river. And we come to chapter 2 and verse 6, where it says, The gates of the rivers shall be opened, and the palaces shall be dissolved. The gates of the rivers opened? That's a strange thing, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, 
We read that Nineveh was to be destroyed by water back in chapter 1. And this is, going back to the historian again, he says that the Kosor River, which ran through the city flooded, broke down the floodgates and part of the wall, which allowed the enemy to come in. So there's the river. It flooded. And historians have got all sorts of ideas to, as to why the river flooded. But it broke down the wall as well. So now the wall's gone. And what's separating the two armies now? Just the river, which is relatively easy to cross. I'm sure we're back to the angel again here. He commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. So it was indeed the voice of Yahweh which destroyed Nineveh by causing the river to flood and to destroy the wall so that the enemies could come in. So there it is, destroyed by water. Where's the enemy now? In the city. Where's the defending army? They're running away for their lives. And that's what the prophet is going to be telling us actually.